The Genesis Account of Origins, Part 2. We've been uh, talking about uh, the Genesis Account of Origins. We've been talking actually about the Genesis Creation Account, uh, two books that are important, uh, the Genesis Creation Account and its reverberations in the Old Testament, and he spoke and it was divine creation in the Old Testament. The latter is an abridgment of the former, uh, and uh, uh, both of them are available. I got, they gave me these, so th that I got by with, but uh, but I, uh, I bought a uh, copy of uh, the first one on uh, Amazon.com for a Kindle so that I could copy it off, which makes my job much easier, for uh, about 10 bucks. Um, there's the two books that we're talking about. Um, and uh, chapter 3 in both parts is entitled, in both books is entitled The Genesis Account of Origins, and it's written by Richard Davidson of Andrews University. Um, and we finished the last uh, section with our, uh, with the paragraph above, which kind of uh, leads us into today's uh, discussion, which is, this leads us to our <coughs> next point concerning whether all of creation described in Genesis 1 and 2 is confined to that literal creation week or whether there is a creation prior to the creation week. A single or two-stage beginning is the question. Does the opening chapter of the Bible depict a single week of creation for all that is encompassed in Genesis 1? And when he says Genesis 1, he means Genesis 1 through Genesis 2, 4, part A. Or does it imply, imply a cri prior creation before creation week and some kind of time gap between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 3 to 2, 4? This issue focuses upon the relationship among Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3 to 2, 4. Scholars have advanced different interpretations of this relationship. There is an active gap theory. A first impression is often labeled as the ruin restoration or active, active, active gap theory view. According to this understanding, Genesis 1-1 describes an originally perfect creation some unknown time ago, millions or billions of years ago. Satan was ruler of this world, but because of his rebellion, described in Isaiah 14, 12 through 17, sin entered the universe. Some proponents of the app active gap position hold that God judged this rebellion and reduced it to the ruined chaotic state described in Genesis 1-2. Others claim that Satan was allowed by God to experiment with this world and the chaos described in Genesis 1-2 is a direct result of sa satanic experimentation. Doesn't really matter which one you pick. In any case, those holding this view translate Genesis 1-2 as follows, but the earth had become a ruin and a desolation. Uh, that he added that emphasis. Um, Genesis 1-3 and the following verses then present an account of a later creation in which God restores what had been ruined. The geologic column is usually fitted into the period of the first creation and the succeeding chaos, not in connection with the biblical flood. And um, now he's not going to address the scientific problems when I'm going to tell you that it's difficult to figure out when the satanic creation ended and when the divine creation ensued, if you're going to go this way. And it's also difficult to find traces for the flood, which is why it was eventually abandoned by Christianity. The ruin restoration or active gap theory flounders purely on grammatical grounds. It simply cannot stand the test of close grammatical analysis. Genesis 1-2 clearly contains three noun clauses, and the fundamental meaning of noun clauses in Hebrew is something fixed, a state or condition, not a sequence or action. According to the laws of Hebrew grammar, one must translate the earth was for unformed and unfilled, not the earth became unformed and unfilled. Thus, Hebrew grammar leaves no room for the act active gap theory. Initial unformed, unfilled view, no gap and passive gap theories. The no gap and passive gap theories are subheadings of an interpretation of biblical cosmogony in Genesis 1 known as the initial unformed, unfilled view. 
This is the traditional view having the support of the majority of Jewish and Christian interpreters through history. According to this initial unformed, unfilled view, in common to both no-gap and passive-gap theories, in other words, at this point, it doesn't matter as long as you don't insist on an active gap, it's the same idea. Genesis 1.1 declares that God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 clarifies that the earth was initially in a state of tohu or unformed and bohu or unfilled. Um, and I'll, uh, we'll comment on uh, tohu and uh, bohu later on. And verse 3 and the verses that follow describe the divine process of forming the unformed and filling the unfilled. Now, if you look at that, this is, of course, from the front of the larger book. Um, you can see that tohu and bohu, both of them uh, do not have the uh, wow or vav, if you prefer, in between here. They're spelled exactly the same except for the T and the B. Um, and to uh, come back here, um, you'll notice that in the text, it has a line over the bohu, but not over the tohu. And I am not sure why. I have not been able to find a good reason for that. I went back to my Hebrew pointed Bible, and it's pointed exactly the same way. And uh, in fact, what I think you're looking at is a term somewhat similar to the English helter-skelter, which means something, but it's hard to pick out what the helter means and what the skelter means that are significantly different. It's, you know, tohu wa bohu. Um, anyway, to come back to Richardson's point, I concur with this view because I find that only this interpretation cohesively follows the natural flow of these verses without contradiction or omission of any element of the text. However, there is disagreement about two crucial aspects in this creation process among those who hold the initial unformed, unfilled view. And so you can think of it a two by two table. These concern number one, when the creation of the heavens and the earth described in verse 1 occurred, either at the commencement, during the seven days of creation, say at the beginning of the, of the first day, uh, or sometime before, with it being tohu and wabohu for some time. And two, what is referred to by the phrase heavens and earth? The entire universe, or only this year, Earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres, that is, our solar system. Depending on how these two aspects are interpreted, there are four major possibilities that present themselves, the two-by-two two table. Two variations of the no-gap theory and two variations of the passive-gap theory. Now, no-gap theory A, young universe, young life. According to the no-gap theory A, verses 1 and 2 are part of the first day of the seven-day creation week, or perhaps immediately before, like, seconds or hours. Um, and the phrase heavens and earth is considered a merism that refers to the entire universe, including the stars. This interpretation includes that the entire universe was created in six literal days some 6,000 years ago. This theory is known as the Young Universe, Young Life view and is equated with contemporary Young Earth scientific creationism espoused by many fundamentalists and cons by conservative evangel evangelicals and represented by such organizations as the Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis. And I think Creation Ministries International as well. Um, no Gap Theory B, Young Earth, but not Universe, Young Life, on Earth. Um, the other variant of the no gap theory also sees verses 1 and 2 as part of the first day of the seven day creation week, but holds that the heavens and the earth refers only to this earth and its immediate surrounding atmospheric heavens and perhaps the solar system. In fact, if you're going to go that way, it's easier to say and probably the solar system. 
this earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres were created during the Genesis, uh, I would say at least the sun. And uh, this earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres were created during the Genesis 1 creation week. And according to this position, nothing is mentioned in Genesis 1 about the creation of the entire universe. This young earth, not universe, young life on earth interpretation has been posited by several scholars. And in fact, I think this is probably the dominant view right now at uh, GRI. Passive gap theory A, old universe including earth, young life on earth, with regard to the passive gap option, some see verses 1 and 2 as chronological unity separated by a gap in time from the first day of creation described in verse 3. The expression <laughs> heavens and earth in verse 1 is taken as a merism to refer to the entire universe that was created in the beginning. So we still have a creation of the entire universe being described. Before creation week, which initial creation may be called the creatio prima or in Latin, that's the first creation. <clears throat> Verse 2 describes the raw materials of the earth in their unformed, unfilled state, which were created before, perhaps long before, the seven days of creation week. Verse 3 and the following verses depict the actual creation week, which may be called creatio segunda, basically uh, uh, the second creation. This is the old universe, including the earth, young life on earth view, and is widely held by Seventh-day Adventist scholars as well as by a number of other interpreters. And interestingly, in this note, which I don't usually do because the notes are um, just supporting his, what he's saying in the text, um, the note says this view was supported by Adventist pioneers such as Uriah Smith, Review, and Herald, July 3, 1860. Nor is there anything in Revelation which forbids us to believe that the substance of the earth was formed long before it received its present organization. The first verse of Genesis may relate to a period millions of ages prior to the events noted in the rest of the chapter. That's uh, uh, Davidson's emphasis. Uh, but uh, you will notice that, um, that here's Uriah Smith, one of our founding fathers publishing in the review apparently without too much controversy and saying that you know maybe uh, the substance of the earth was there for a long time but that God took and reformed it or reformed it at, at the creation so you know it goes back a long ways before present um, not all geological controversy but certainly present geological controversy um, just for a perspective, 1859 was when Origin of Species was published, so this is just after the Origin of Species. Um, passive Gap Theory B, Old Earth, Young Life on Earth. Another variant of the Passive Gap position also sees Genesis 1-1 separated from verse 3 by a chronological gap, but considers the expression heavens and earth as referring only to this earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres which were in their unformed, unfilled state for an unspecified length of time before the events described in Creation Week. According to this possibility, nothing is said about the creation of the universe in Genesis 1. This is the old earth, young life on earth position and is supported by some Seventh-day Adventist scholars. They're basically, they have a gap and they also insist that the heavens and the earth that were done in, in Genesis 1, 1 were not the entire universe, but just simply the solar system. Evaluation. So this is um, Davidson's evaluation. Even though the no gap theory A, young university in life, is very popular among conservative evangelicals and Christian fundamentalists, Seventh-day Adventist interpreters have generally rejected this option because positing a creation of the entire universe in the six-day creation week does not allow for the rise of the great controversy in heaven involving the rebellion of Lucifer turned Satan and his angels that is described in many biblical passages as a process that clearly took far more than a week to develop. And the familiar passages in Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation are given. <clears throat> Furthermore, it contradicts the clear statement in Job 38, 4-7, which reveals that at the laying of this earth's foundations, the unfallen heavenly beings, that is, the morning stars and the sons of God, were already in existence. 
Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That last line seems to suggest that there were observers at the creation of the world. The young universe, young life view also falters if Genesis 1, 1, and 2 may be shown to stand outside the six days of creation described in Genesis 1, 3 and the following verses, evidence for which will be presented below. The no gap theory B, young year, earth, not universe, young life on earth, is a possibility that I do not totally rule out. Proponents of this view argue that the terms Hashemayim, the heavens, and Ha'aretz, the earth in verse 1, are the same terms found later in the chapter and thus should be regarded as referring to the same identities. This earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres, not the entire universe. Now he won't go into detail, but I'll just give you a little bit here. And that is that Hashemayim, remember that on day 2, God called the firmament heaven the rakia, whatever that is, and we'll get into that in another Sabbath. But uh, so that implies that uh, whatever was created on the second day actually was the heaven, and that, uh, that uh, you could say heaven and earth, he's creating the firmament, and he's creating the earth, Haaretz. Uh, on the third day, he called the dry land earth, Haaretz. They also point out that the phrase translated as the heavens and the earth, uh, Genesis 1-1, appears again in virtually the same form at the conclusion of the six days of creation, that is in Genesis 2-1, and suggests that Genesis 1-1 and 2-1 con constitute an inclusio. You know, uh, uh, you start saying this is what was being done and then you finish saying this is what was done. Um, introducing and concluding the six days of creation. Furthermore, the reference in the fourth commandment of the Decalogue to the heavens and the earth being made in six days is seen as supporting this position. However, as will be discussed below, a careful examination of these very points actually favors the passive gap A view. Old universe, including earth, young life on earth. Evidence for a two-stage creation of this earth. The passive gap interpretation. The four alternative positions we have presented in this section may also be labeled in terms of the number of creation stages represented and what is being created. No gap A, single stage creation. No gap B, single stage creation, but only of this earth. Passive gap A, two stage creation of the entire universe, including the earth. Um, passive gap B, two stage creation, of this earth only. A number of textual considerations and intertextual parallels lead to a preference of the two-stage creation, that is passive gap, interpretation in general, and more specifically, variation A, the two-stage creation of the entire universe, also called the old universe, including earth, young life for this earth view. And as you will see as we go along, that's the view that Richard Davidson uh, supports. First, as John Hartley points out in his NIBCOT commentary, the consistent pattern used for each day of creation tells us that verses 1 and 2 are not an integral part of the first day of creation, that is verses 3 through 5. That is, these first two verses stand apart from the report of what God did on the first day of creation. And as I read it in the Hebrew, this is pretty obvious actually. Hartley is referring to the fact that as each of the six days of creation begins with the word, and God said, and ends with the formula, and there was evening, and there was morning, day X. If the description of the first day is consistent with the other five, this would place verses 1 to 2 outside of, and therefore before, the first day of creation. Remember, uh, it, and God said is the first part of verse 3. Second, recent discourse analysis of the beginning of the Genesis 1 creation account indicates that the discourse grammar of these verses points to a two-stage creation. See, John Collins noticed that none of the verbs in Genesis 
1, 1, and 2 are in the yektol form. The verb in verse 1 is imperfect, and the three clauses in verse 2 are all stative, and there is one verb, and it is, uh, and it is perfect. The first yektol form appears in verse 3, and that, by the way, is a standard narrative form, the yektol. Um, and each of the other workdays begins with this form. Hence, the main storyline does not start until verse 3. He further notes that the verb bara, create, in Genesis 1-1 is in the perfect inflection. And he shows how throughout the Pentateuch, the normal use of the per perfect at the very beginning of a pericope is to denote, denote an event that took place before the storyline gets underway. This implies a previous creation of the heavens and earth in their unformed, unfilled state before the beginning of creation week and supports either variation of the passive gap interpretation. Third, as we will argue uh, under the section of uh, the what of creation, section 5, the phrase heavens, the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1 is most probably to be taken here as often elsewhere in scripture as a merism, a merismus in Latin, to include all that God has created, in other words, the entire universe. Uh, if heavens and earth referred to the whole universe, this beginning, at least for part of the heavens, must have been before the first day of Earth's creation week, since the sons of God, unfallen created beings, had already been created and sang for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid, Job 38.7. This point supports the passive gap theory A as opposed to B. Further forth, we will also argue in, what, in the what section, section 5, so we've got a little more to go on this uh, chapter, that the dyad heavens and earth, entire universe of Genesis 1-1, are to be distinguished from the triad heaven, earth, and sea, the three earth habitats of Genesis 1-3 through 31 and Exodus 20-11. This means that the creation account of Genesis 1-1 is outside of or before the six-day, I don't know what that did. Oh, I, I think I know. It's six-day creation of Exodus 20-11 and of Genesis 1-3 through 31. This point also supports passive gap theory A, not B. Fifth, the expression of the heavens and the earth indeed brackets the first creation account as noted by those who support the no gap theory. But what is not usually recognized in that argumentation is that the phrase heavens and earth appear twice at the end of the creation account in Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, a. It occurs in Genesis 1, uh, 2, 1, but in this verse it is used to refer to the triad of habitats found in Genesis 1, 3 to 31. The entire phrase that we find in this verse is the heavens and the earth and all the host of them. Emphasis added, which is not a merism like Genesis 1-1, but a reference to the biosphere, which is formed and filled during the six days of creation. There is, however, a merism employed, employing the dyad, heavens and earth, only at the end of the Genesis 1 creation account, and I, that should be reference 104. Uh, it is found in, in 2-4-A. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. It is this reference to heavens and earth that parallels the phrase in Genesis 1-1 and like Genesis 1-1 refers to the creation of the entire cosmos, that is, the universe. We thus find a chiastic structure with an ABBA pattern in the usage of the phrase heavens and earth. And here's the chiasm. A, Genesis 1-1, the dyad. Uh, B, Genesis 1-3 to 31, the triad of the three inhabitants are the three habitats, Genesis 2, 1, the triad, heavens and earth and their hosts, involving the earth's three habitats. Uh, in Genesis 2, 4, a, dyad or merism, heavens and earth, referring to the entire universe. This point supports the passive gap theory A and not theory B. Now, I'm, I, personally, I'm a little reluctant to, to stand on this really tightly it does make sense, but I, I will have to say that, that the A parts certainly do match uh, better than A matches B2. Sixth, 
sail maker, uh, pardon me, sail hammer points out that the Hebrew word for beginning used in Genesis 1-1, reshit, as in bereshit, um, does not point to, does not refer to a point in time, but to a period or duration of time which falls before a series of events. In the context of Genesis 1, 1 through 3, this would seem to imply that in the first verse of the Bible, we are taken back to the process in time in which God created the universe. Uh, B, sometime, before, sometime during that process, this earth was created, but it was initially in an unformed, unfilled state. Um, and C, as a potter or architect first gathers his materials and then at some point later begins shaping the pot on the potter's wheel or constructing the building, so God, the master artist, potter, and architect, first created the raw materials of the earth and then at the appropriate creative moment began to form and fill the earth in six literal working days, in the six literal working days of creation week. The text of Genesis 1-1 does not indicate how long before creation week the universe, heavens and earth, was created. This and the following points could be seen to support a two-stage creation, either variation A or B of the passive gap interpretation. Seventh, already in the creation account of Genesis 1, 3 through 31, there's an emphasis of, upon God's differentiating or separating previously created materials. On the second day, God divided what was already present, the waters from the waters, S verses 6 through 8. On the third day, the dry land appeared, which seems to imply that it was already present under the water and simply was moved up above, um, and the previously existing earth brought forth vegetation. On the fifth day, the waters brought forth the fish, and on the sixth day, the earth brought forth land creatures, implying God's use of pre-existing elements. As we will note in the section 5 discussion of what, on the what of creation, the same pattern seems to be true with the creation of the greater and lesser lights on the fourth day and the light of day one. That God simply separated things out. Eight, such a two-stage process of Genesis 1, like the work of a potter artifact architect, is supported by the complementary creation account of Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, 7, it is evident that God began with previously created ground or clay, and from this formed the man. There is a two-stage process, beginning with the raw materials, the clay, and proceeding to the forming of man and breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. It is probably not accidental that the narrator here uses the word yatsar to form, which describes what a potter does with the clay on his potter's wheel. The participial form of yatsar actually means the potter. The participial form would be like the English former, that is the person who forms. Um, and the narrator may here be alluding to God's artistic work as a master potter. In God's creation of the woman, he likewise follows a two-stage process. He starts with the raw materials that are already created, the side or rib of the man, and from this God builds, bana, the woman. Again, it is certainly not accidental that not only here, that only here in Genesis 1 and 2 is the verb bana, to architecturally design and build, used for God's creation. He is the master designer and architect as he creates woman. Ninth, intertextual parallels between Genesis 1 and 2 and the account of building of the wilderness sanctuary in Solomon's temple, which um, impact on the sanctuary uh, theory, uh, seem to point further towards a two-stage creation for this earth. We've already mentioned in passing that the work of creation in Genesis 1 and 2 described, is described in technical language that specifically parallels the building of Moses' sanctuary in Solomon's temple. Such intertextual linkages have led me to join numerous Old Testament interpreters in recognizing that, according to the narrative clues, the whole earth is, seen, is to be seen as the original courtyard and the Garden of Eden as the original sanctuary or temple on this planet. What is significant to note for our purposes at this point is that the construction of both the Mosaic Sanctuary and the Solomonic Temple took place in two stages. First came the gathering material according to the divine plan and command. And there's the text for it. And then came the building process utilizing the previously gathered materials. 
and there's the text for that. A, pos a pattern of two-stage divine creative activity seems to emerge from these intertextual parallels that gives further impetus to accepting the passive gap interpretation of Genesis 1. Last, but certainly not least, God's creative activity throughout the rest of the Bible often involves a two-stage process, presupposing a previous creation. Examples include God's creating of his people Israel using language, uh, using language of Genesis 1-2, and I, I guess I missed a couple of these uh, that should be uh, uh, superscript. God's creation of a new heart, Psalms 1, uh, uh, 51, 10. His making of the new or renewed covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. And Jesus' healing miracles involving a two-stage creation, for example, John 9, 6, and 7. Um, and that's the man born blind. There's also the man who was blind and, and who saw things like trees walking and Jesus gave him a second touch. In particular, the eschatological creation of the new heavens and earth presupposes previously existing materials. Inasmuch as protology parallels eschatology in scripture, Genesis 1 through 3 matching Revelation 20 through 22, it is vital to observe the depictions of the eschatological new creation described in Second Peter three ten through thirteen and Revelation twenty two twenty through twenty two, and their parallels with Genesis one and two. After the second coming of Christ, the earth will return to its unformed, unfilled condition, paralleling Genesis one twenty two. And there's some text for that. Passages which use the terminology of Genesis one, two especially Jeremiah 4, which is the only, I think the only other place where tohu and bohu is found together. Um, after the millennium, the earth will be purified by fire, but a new heaven and a new earth will not be created ex nihilo, but out of the purified raw materials. Uh, stoicheion, actually stoicheia, the plural, or elements in uh, 2 Peter 3.12, remaining from the first purification process. Elements that have been ex in existence for at least thousands of years. If the eschatological creation involved a, a two-stage process with God use, utilizing previously created material to create a new heaven and earth, then it would not be out of character for God to have followed a similar two-stage creation in Genesis 1 and 2. A growing number of recent studies on Genesis 1, 1 through 3 have come to support the conclusion of a two-stage creation and the passive gap interpretation, in particular the old universe, including Earth, young life on Earth, variation. Cullen's conclusion is illustrative and represents my current understanding of Genesis 1, 1 through 3. It tells us of the origin of everything in the universe and in 1, 1, and then narrows its attention as the account proceeds. The first verse, as I see it, narrates the initial creation event. Then verse 2 describes the condition of the earth just before the creation week gets underway. These two verses stand outside the six days of God's work week and, just speaking grammatically, say nothing about the length of time between the initial event of 1-1 and the first day of 1-3. I might parenthetically note that without light or a sun, there's nothing to mark off days. Um, those who support the no-gap theory often argue against the passive-gap theory by denying any evidence for such a theory in the biblical text. There is no textual or contextual basis for supposing that it, that is Genesis 1-1, introduces a second process of creation described in Genesis 1-2-31, separated by an indefinite period of time, as, parenthesis, as much as 13.7 billion years, close parenthesis, from a first process of creation mentioned in Genesis 1.1. And again, I, that's a note. But I have set forth at least 10 lines of evidence from the text that it in fact does support a two-stage creation. In connection with this argument, it is often conjectured that the gap theory seems to be motivated by a desire to harmonize Genesis 1 with a modern scientific understandings with modern, excuse me, with modern and scientific understandings of the size and age of the known universe by interpreting Genesis 1, 2 through 31 as describing only the creation of life on planet Earth. And again, that's a note. It, 
suggest, uh, it is suggested that the passive gap theory is a concordist endeavor to harmonize scripture and science. We are not, those are his ellipses, we are being forced to accept the gap by science, not scripture. My answer to these arguments is that I have come to my present conviction regarding the proper interpretation of Genesis 1, 1 through 3, not because of an attempt to harmonize scripture and science. I could be just as comfortable believing in the creation of both raw materials and life forms on earth within a period of six literal contiguous days, all with an appearance of old or mature age, if this were the direction the biblical evidence pointed. In fact, I used to defend this position. But it is the Hebrew text of Genesis 1, not science, that leads me to support my current position. The passive gap, old universe, including this earth, young life for this earth, interpretation of Genesis 1. My interpretation is not dependent on or motivated by the accuracy or inaccuracy of the radiometric time clocks for earth rocks, but represents an attempt to be faithful to scripture. And if some scientific data are harmonized in the process, well, then all the better. John Lennox has stated it well. Quite apart from any scientific considerations, the text of Genesis 1-1 in separating the beginnings from day one leaves the age of the universe indeterminate. It would therefore be logically possible to believe that the days of Genesis are 24-hour days of one earth week and to believe that the universe is very ancient. I repeat, this has nothing to do with science, rather it has to do with what the text actually says, at least says John Lennox. Uh, implications for modern scientific interpretation. Despite my preference for the passive gap theory A interpretation, old universe including Earth, young life on Earth, over the passive gap theory B interpretation, old Earth, uh, young life on Earth, or the no gap theory B interpretation, young Earth, not universe, young life on Earth. Um, <coughs> despite my preference for that theory, I acknowledge a possible openness in Genesis 1-1, 2, that at least theoretically allows for any of these options. However, I do not see any room in the biblical text viewed in the light of the larger biblical context, particularly things like Job, uh, for the no-gap theory, A, view, young universe including earth, young life. The possible openness in the Hebrew text as to whether there's a gap or not between Genesis 1-1 and verse 3 and th through 31 has implications for interpretation of the pre-fossil layers of the geologic column. If one accepts the no-gap theory B option, young earth, not universe, young life on earth, there is a possibility of relatively young pre-fossil rocks created as part of the seven-day creation wake, perhaps with the appearance of old age. Um, and so he's referring, I think, specifically to the Precambrian, that that could be uh, that could be created that way. If one accepts the passive gap theory A option, old universe including Earth, young life on Earth, my preference, or the passive gap theory B option, old Earth, young life on Earth. Uh, there is the alternative possibility of the pre-fossil raw material being created at a time of absolute beginning of this earth and its surrounding heavenly spheres at an unspecified time in the past. This initial unformed, unfilled state is d described in verse 2. Verse, verses 3 through 31 then describe the process of forming and filling during the seven-day creation week. I conclude that the biblical text of Genesis 1 leaves room for either A, young pre-fossil rock created as part of the seven days of creation with the appearance of old age, or much older pre-fossil earth rocks with a long interval between creation of the inanimate raw materials on earth described in Genesis 1, 1, and 2, and the seven days of creation week described in Genesis 1, 3, and the following verses, which I find the preferable interpretation. In either case, the biblical text calls for a short chronology for the creation of life on earth. And that's one thing that uh, he, other Adventists, and people from, let's say, Answers in Genesis or Creation Ministries International are all united on. According to Genesis 1, there is no room for any gap of time in the creation of life on this earth. 
It came during the third through the sixth of the literal contiguous approximately 24-hour days of creation week. This leads us to our next point. A recent or remote beginning. We have no information in scripture as to how long ago God created the universe as a whole. But there is strong evidence for concluding that the creation of week describing, uh, pardon me, described in Genesis 1, 3 through 2, 4 was recent sometime in the last several thousand years and not hundreds of thousands, millions or billions of years ago. Uh, these unique interlocking features indicate a specific focus on chronological time and reveal an intention to make clear that there are no gaps between the in individual patriarchs mentioned. A patriarch lived X years, begat a son. After he begat this son, he lived Y more years and begat more sons and daughters. All the years of this patriarch were Z years. And they add up. X plus Y equals Z. These tight interlocking features make it virtually impossible to argue that significant generational gaps exist. Rather, their intent is to present the complete time sequence from father to direct biological son throughout the genealogical sequence from a Adam to Abraham. To further substantiate the absence of major gaps in the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11, the Hebrew grammatical form of the verb begat, yalad in the hiphil, is used throughout these chapters, pardon me, used throughout these chapters, is a special causative form that elsewhere in the Old Testament always refers to actual direct physical offspring, that is, biological father son relationship. And there's a list of where it's used elsewhere. This is in contrast to the appearance of Yalad in the simple call form, which is actually Yalad. The other one is, uh, oh, I'm, uh, I'm blocking on the, on the exact, it's, uh, um, in many of the other biblical genealogies, which, in which cases, in which cases, it is not always used in reference to the direct physical fathering of immediate, uh, immediately succeeding offspring. And the, the most uh, obvious kind of thing that you hear is that you know, somebody is the son of David, and he's not the son of David. He's the great, great, whatever, grandson of David. Um, <clears throat> In Genesis 5 and 11, there is clearly a concern for completeness, accuracy, and precise length of time. There are several different textual versions of the chronological data in these two chapters. The Masoretic text, or Hebrew, the Septuagint, that's LXX is the 70, which uh, Septuagint is uh, the Greek translation, and the Samaritan Pentateuch. The scholarly consensus is that the Masoretic text has pres preserved the original figures in their purest form, while the Septuagint and Samaritan <coughs> versions have intentionally schematized the, figure for the figures for theological reasons. But regardless of which text is chosen, even if you were to choose, let's say, the Septuagint, it only represents a difference of a thousand years or so. That is... Uh, maybe you're doing 2302 B.C., um, the other one would be 3500 B.C. It's not that much difference. Regarding the chronology from Abraham to the present, there is disagreement among Bible-believing scholars whether the Israelite sojourn in Egypt was 215 years or 430 years, and I'll add actually 210 according to, the, uh, uh, according to some uh, uh, Jewish traditions, uh, and thus whether to put Abraham in the early 2nd millennium or the late 3rd millennium B.C. But other than this minor difference, the basic chronology from Abraham to the present is clear from Scripture, and the total is only some 4,000 plus or minus 200 years, which is not that much. Thus the Bible presents a relatively recent creation of life on this earth a few thousand years ago, not hundreds of thousands, millions, or billions. While minor ambiguities do not allow us to determine the exact date, according to scripture, the seven-day creation week unambiguously occurred recently. This recent creation becomes significant in the, in the light of the character of God, the next point in our outline. 
We can already say here that a God of love surely would not allow pain and suffering to continue any longer than necessary to make clear the issues in the great controversy. He wants to bring an end to suffering and death as soon as possible. It is totally out of character with the God of the Bible to allow a history of cruelty and pain to go on for long periods of time, millions of years, when it would serve no purpose in demonstrating the nature of his character in the cosmic controversy against Satan. Thus, the genealogies pointing to a recent creation are a window into the heart of a loving, compassionate God. Now, my take on this section, I think Davidson has outlined the problem well. I agree with his tentative solution. Uh, I am most interested in the scientific modeling su suggested by the various interpretations of Genesis 1 and 2. He, of course, completely ignores, or almost completely ignores it, um, as he is only concerned with what the biblical text says. I think that if one assumes that life on earth has a short chronology, science that does not take theology into account will have, it in that case, failed in practice and cannot be a dominant guide to the history of the universe. So that listening to people like Davidson is more valuable than listening to scientists in the main. Davidson A1 translates into a young universe model. His A2 translates into an old universe, old earth, young life model. His B1 translates into an old universe, young solar system model. And his B2 translates into an old universe, possibly old earth, but young life model. All of them have in common young life. Thus the major questions suggested by the models are, is there evidence for an old or young universe? Is there evidence for a young or old solar system? And is there evidence for a young or old Earth? So if you're going to look at the physical, you know, the scientific, if you like, uh, questions, those are the questions that you would want to be asking. The age of life on Earth, again, would not be in dispute. I think that young life creationists of any stripe should cooperate where we can. I think that where we disagree, we should, when necessary, make our hopefully tentative positions clear, state the reasons for them, acknowledge contrary evidence, and refrain from polemics. In fact, that rule might be generalizable. I think that if we are dealing with people who are, um, uh, let's say, arguing for um, intelligent design, we make common cause where we can. We differ politely where we uh, differ. And we let the facts speak for themselves. Our job is not necessarily to convert. Our job is to allow the Holy Spirit to do that job. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. OK, we have a couple of comments back. And ladies first. This is a question about uh, the heavens and the earth. He maintains that the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1, as I understand it, mean the whole universe. That's correct. But then he gives this, the Genesis and Revelation, that there's a, a mirror right. to the two. And, and God says, I will make a new heavens and a new earth. Uh-huh. Does he consider? He doesn't say whether he considers that the whole universe. That's an interesting point. So the, that would the, be my question. The, obviously, the uh, Genesis. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a hand back there. Uh, the Genesis. Uh, 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 account is being uh, alluded to in Revelation, uh, and it. And uh, unless the entire universe is cleansed by fire, um, it does kind of imply that at least, at least uh, some of the universe is left to run on its own. Of course, one could argue that only the Earth has been uh, uh, transformed by the uh, occurrence of sin. And so only the Earth and its immediate environs need to be cleansed. Although, we'll have to say it's kind of funny because the, uh, uh, in, in Revelation it mentions that the sun is not needed for light, 
suggesting mm -hmm. that the sun is um, at least partly changed. So maybe there's more to it than just cleansing the earth. Maybe the rest of the solar <coughs> system needs a house cleaning. But uh, uh, but it does kind of raise the interesting question, is how far out does that cleansing go? Does it go just to our galaxy? Does it go beyond our galaxy? And so forth. Um, I'm not sh One of the things I think when you study this, and I think Richard would agree with this, is that uh, although we can give evidences for what uh, we think is the most likely correct answer, we don't actually have it totally 100% nailed down, and we could be wrong. And I think whenever we discuss this with people, I think we need to acknowledge that fact. That, you know, it looks more likely, but, you know, there are arguments on the other side. And by the way, anybody who's curious about what the, uh, um, what the short age for the universe people do with those texts, uh, they put them in parallel universes. So, I guess multiple universes are not unique to evolutionists. Right? Anyway, go ahead, and then we'll come back here. Without revealing too much of my confused conservatism, I have commentaries from the late 19th, early 20th century, certainly before higher criticism took root. That, well, really took root. Uh, uh, higher criticism goes back to the 1800s. Yeah. But go ahead. Um, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> you have commentaries from like oh, the 1920s. Yes. The, the commentators there suggest that in this matter we might do well to refer back to the hundreds or thousands of years of Jewish uh, interpretation of their own language to see what they think the words meant. For instance, after Bereshith bara, <coughs> in bara, they say the rabbis had no and absolutely no concept of a recreating out of stuff that was already there, but in fact that, that Bara always refers to new elements. And in their final conclusion, they suggest uh, creation of the solar system at the same time the Earth was created. Um, well, certainly the sun and the moon uh, would be would be implied as being created, except for one thing, and that is that it doesn't actually say the sun. Mm. It says the greater light. And from that, I take it that either the light was allowed through, or possibly the light was created during uh, during a creation weekend. Personally, I find it easier to believe that light was that the sun was created itself, and the reason why is the sun doesn't really have any kind of agent to it. Now, you'll hear people say, well, the sun really is, um, you know, 4.6 billion years like everything else. And the argument I think that is made would say that the sun was collected out of dust and whatever and, and lots and lots of hydrogen. Um, and it's about 15% helium and that's about how much helium you'd expect after being burned for so long. But there's a problem with that theory, and that is, how do you know it started out with 0% helium to begin with? It started out with a whole bunch of other elements in it, obviously, because it's not been making its own uh, iron or whatever, the calcium that's in the spectrum of the sun. So that means the sun had other elements. Why should it be pure from helium? Um, and I, I've never seen that. I've never seen that problem discussed, and I particularly have not seen it discussed when you realize that the Earth has other elements. Um, most of our other uh, planets have other elements. Well, all of them, I guess. Um, and why the sun would be different from them in that regard is not clear. And if the sun is going to pull hydrogen in, it seems like it ought to pull helium in. So the truth of the matter is the people who are insisting that the sun started out with no helium kind of stretching it a bit. 
the sun does not have an age in the same way that, let's say, rocks have a radiometric age. Even if you allow that radiometric dating is valid in this, that situation, um, the sun does not have that kind of age. And so there's no particular reason why it couldn't have been created during creation week. Uh, that's, of course, getting away from the biblical question and going into how do you fit this into science or how do you fit science into this, if you prefer. Now, we have a comment here, and did you have one also? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to, I want to emphasize the fact that all these differences do not alter the six day creation. And the fact that we're here today as a memorial of that. Uh, these are other ideas that do not affect the fact that God did it in six days. All the models he proposed, of course, also accommodate that. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to um, especially emphasize here is that uh, in support of his uh, passive gap A model, that uh, there are suggestions, other suggestions in the Bible that uh, in general, you might say, the Bible believers uh, believed in uh, something here before creation week. Uh, not just Adventists, and he, he mentioned Uriah Smith uh, in 1860, W.C. Wilcox uh, in uh, 1898 in the review also emphasizes the fact that uh, there may have been an empty earth here before creation week. So Adventists have, have traditionally sta stood by that, but to get to the, to the Bible itself, uh, Job uh, seems to say, keep in mind, uh, Genesis 1-2 talks about uh, a dark earth and water. These are part of the characteristics of it. Uh, Job 38.9 says, When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. That's God speaking in Job there. So uh, again, there's an emphasis on a dark earth there, which would fit with Genesis 1.2 as being prior to creation week. Then there's uh, Psalms 24, 2, uh, speaking again of God and so on as a, his creation. It says, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Sounds like when it was created, there was water there to start with, as you would have if Genesis 1, 2, 2 is prior to creation week. And then there's Psalms 136, 9, excuse me, 6. Psalms 136, verse 6. Uh, it's talking about giving thanks to God and so on and praising him. And, and they're, they're praising him through this psalm. And it says, to him who laid the earth above the waters. Again, sounds like the act, there's an activity after. There was some water there to start out with, which again fits with Genesis 1. Two being prior to creation week. And uh, then the second Peter three verse five. Uh, speaking of people of uh, the last days, Peter says, For they willingly forget that by the word of God the heavens of old and the earth standing out of water and in in water, and that second thing in water refers to the flood, but he's saying standing out of water again. Uh, it looks in general that, that the, the, the Bible writers uh, kind of thought, well, there's something here before before that. I I mentioned these texts and Psalms to, to Dick Davidson. I was talking to him about it. This, and he said, yeah, he, he agrees that uh, these uh, texts and Psalms, uh, speaking of water there first and so on, fit, of course, it, this would agree if his model yeah. 2B. On uh, 2A. Uh, yeah. Now, to be so, fair, it's not necessarily yeah. contradictory because if God had, uh, yeah. with the no-gap model or a, a minimal gap, yeah. 
that, that God could have formed the earth uh, with water covering the surface to begin with and then <laughs> brought the dry land out afterwards. You could do that, but why should that detail be mentioned so often? It makes you think that there was an earth here before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two quick questions. Um, does Dr. Davidson refer in his bibliography to Ellen White or any um, info from Ellen White? writings and the second when you mentioned um, Brian Bull and Dr. Guy um, I was curious to know how they keep us honest I, I, is that what oh. you said they're, they're <laughs> yeah. gonna come they're gonna help us to, and I wasn't <laughs> sure what you meant by that well, or, or, am I, I opening a can of worms <laughs> I, oh, I, I was being I was being a little bit facetious but but not I, I think it is good for us to it, it's good for us and it's good for other people uh, when we have uh, <coughs> philosophical disagreements to be talking to each other, talking with each other present, so that um, we are a little more careful about how we state things. And, and, uh, because there's a tendency, if you're, if you're by yourself, uh, to kind of just get a okay. little over-enthusiastic. Whereas if you have people who will call you to account, if you uh, stretch it a little bit, I see. it tends to keep you from stretching it. I'm not familiar. I'm not very familiar with, with either of the two gentlemen, so that's why I ask. Yeah. And, no. and does he refer to Ellen White's writings um, uh, in his bibliography? You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, mm. I did not look through all the notes. I do, not, I do know mm. that when he wrote this, uh, the text has basically nothing to say about Ellen White. Yeah. Uh, I think that's deliberate, and I think the reason why is because part of the audience, the intended audience for these two books, in particular the Genesis creation account, mm -hmm. is people for whom Ellen White is not an authority. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to stick with Scripture alone, uh, which I think is a... Uh, at least if you're dealing with that audience, I think it's a good thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, Ellen White has, says repeatedly that she is a lesser light intended, intending to lead us to the greater light. Presumably the greater light has the light that's there. And we just are missing that light or misunderstanding it or however you want to put that. Uh, and so uh, I'm far more comfortable supporting a position with uh, let's say two good texts that that are are pertinent uh, from the Bible, than I am with thirty uh, Ellen White quotations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, with reference to Ellen White, uh, an article which uh, I wrote for the review. Uh, As you can see, we have some <laughs> deep thinkers in our audience here. <laughs> she does make some statements like. Um, when the foundation of the earth were laid, the Sabbath, that was when the Sabbath was laid. When, and some people say, well, that, laying the foundation doesn't make, make a matter. And, and Dick Davidson pointed very well out the two-stage thing that's common and things. But, but uh, more specifically, she states, in the work of creation, when the dawn of the first day broke and the heavens and the earth, by the call of infinite power, came out of darkness, again referring to Genesis 1 verse 2, I would say, uh, responsive to the rising light, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. That's obviously from... Uh, Quoting from Job. Yeah. Job 9, 7. Uh, so um, she seems to uh, also agree with most of the writers at least you can f fit her comments into the idea that there was an earth here before creation week, uh, an empty earth here before creation week. Let's see, a comment there and then one behind you afterwards. Go ahead. Okay, I've always kind of figured that because it's an old, has to be an old universe for the, if there are stars billions of light years away, we wouldn't be seeing their light now, see? Uh, we'll come back to that. Yes. Okay, and then, but then my question is actually, 
with the moon, my understanding is that the moon is moving an inch away every year. So if we go billions of years backwards, we'd have the moon rolling around right in our faces here now. And uh, <laughs> so we'd have, to, we'd have to have kind of a young Earth and solar system then w with that in mind. At least younger than traditional. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's a little worse than that because it isn't just an inch a year. That is, as you get, if you go back in time, you get closer. The tidal forces that are driving the moon out actually increase. And uh, the claim that I have seen, and I haven't seen anybody that disputes it, uh, although maybe your brother can help us out with that, um, is that as uh, that the force that drives the moon away actually varies with the seventh power of the distance, um, which is not uh, well. It, it has to do with it has to do with how much tidal force there is. See, and as you get closer, the tidal forces get greater. So that the so that so that early on it would be going faster and then come out. And if that's the case, uh, then uh, what we're looking at uh, is a. a um, a moon that would uh, a moon that would have had to emerge from the Earth um, something like uh, one billion years in st instead of 4.5 billion years, which shall we say squashes the time frame a little. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to see somebody go over those, you know, go over the calculations and go over the uh, the uh, the uh, strength of the tidal forces. I do know that as you get in, it's not a linear relationship. In other words, you can't just go one inch a year and figure that's where you're going to get. Uh, that, that there is more, for, uh, more force being transferred from rotational energy to, uh, to energy of, of uh, revolution around the, uh, around the Earth. Uh, so there is, there is there is some evidence that your point is even stronger than you may have realized. Uh, uh, there are a number of things that are happening in the in the universe, uh, uh, or in our, in our solar system, that kind of argue that maybe uh, maybe 4.5 billion years is really not mechanically justified. Uh, for Earth, we have the problem of erosion, um, but there are a number of other problems. That something weird happened to Pluto. And uh, within the last um, 100,000 years or so, you can't really say exactly, but you can say that, uh, that Pluto is doing, uh, has evidence of a young surface. Uh, we went over this when we discussed uh, the uh, Pluto flyby a few months ago. And, and if you go to the website over there, you can actually find that discussion. Uh, so there are a lot of things that, uh, that people haven't thought of. Now, that doesn't prove a young age for the, um, the solar system, let alone the universe. But it does suggest that, um, that the standard stories that we have don't necessarily fit together. Um, there is one other thing that I think is kind of important in this regard, and that is uh, uh, <coughs> that uh, the, the standard way of, of, uh, of looking at things may be wrong even if, uh, even if the universe is older than 6,000 years. Uh, and, and one of the uh, uh, one of the theories that's out there right now is the plasma universe, which um, implies um, uh, a much more rapid formation of the universe than what we would normally expect. And if that actually holds water, which it may or may not, but uh, we may be looking at you know 180 million years for the universe instead of 13.7 billion. 
uh, complete with uh, possibly some acceleration of the uh, speed of light in the past. Um, and this is being proposed by people who are secular scientists. So, um, you know, don't have any particular axe to grind in that regard. So, I think that even if we accept an old universe, it doesn't mean that we accept 13.7 billion years. Uh, I mean, even the, uh, the Big Bang Theory uh, proponents will tell you that, well, it used to be 12 to 20, depending on what you're looking at. And there was some evidence that it might have been eight, but then they said, no, it can't be because we have uh, globular clusters older than that, so it must be more like 12. And the 13.7 is actually a, uh, not a, the kind of figure that is gotten precisely by several different methods, but it's actually a kind of a compromise age. So, you know, take all of that stuff with a grain of salt even if you're going to go old age. Uh, there was one other question, and that is uh, of, of interest. Um, uh, what do short ages do with the speed of light? Well, there's, there's two ways of dealing with it. One of them is, you know, I mean, if something is 13 billion light years out there, then you can't see it until 13 years later, right? uh, 13 billion years later, right? And so that would seem to be a one way of arguing that the universe is uh, very old and if, if it's not 13, it's at least some, some reasonable facsimile thereof and uh, plenty of time for a 4.5 billion or whatever year age for Earth. Uh, and the, the, uh, there's two major ways of dealing with it besides just the Earth was created and the universe was created with the appearance of age. Um, one of them is that light traveled faster back then and that the speed of light has been slowing down, usually because of, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the term for it, the zero point energy of the universe has been decreasing. Um, and in fact, in some cases, it would be claimed that it's increase, decreasing uh, in a um, stepwise fashion. Um, and, and that's one way they try to shrink the age of the universe down. Um, the second way of shrinking the age of the universe down is actually not shrinking it. It's, it's shrinking the age of the Earth down, but not the universe. Proposing that the Earth was the center of a giant ball of water that was allowed to expand through a white hole, which is the reverse of a black hole. That is, things go out of it rather than into it. And eventually, and, and so seven days on Earth turned out to be what looks like um, 12 billion, 13 billion, whatever years for the rest of the universe. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting theory. It's um, uh, I'm trying to think of what his name is. Uh, uh, Russell? No, uh, Russ, uh, the guy who proposed that, Starlight and Time, Russell Humphreys. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they do work on these problems and they do have some kind of interesting solutions. Um, what I'd love to see from that kind of a theory is, and here's what our theory predicts, and here's what the standard theory predicts, and they predict these two different things in this particular area, so let's go look and see which one is actually there and find out which theory is more closely fits the facts. When we have those kinds of proposals from them, I'll get very, very interested in their theories. Right now, they're just kind of out there and yeah, you, know, you can believe them or not, depending on how you want to view things. Uh, that's one of the nice things that I have about carbon-14 dating is that I went and said, here's these theories, and they say that you should find carbon-14. Here's these theories, and they don't say that you should find carbon-14. And we, so we go and look, and sure enough, there's carbon-14. And to me, that's the real core of science is 
when you have competing theories and they make different predictions uh, and, you, and you find one or the other. Anyway, I think there's a comment back here and there's one here. Referring to the comment on Ellen White, she does say rather specifically that God was not dependent upon pre-existing matter at the time of creation. And then again, she says that he spoke and it was, suggesting, I think, that rather than bringing it out of earth out of the water, commanded it to stand forth, that perhaps uh, he's showing the power that he has to create ex nihilo. Well, that's an interesting point. Um, one could go through and look in every place where it says bara in the, in, the, uh, in the Genesis 1 account and say, well, that one was made just ex nihilo. Uh, in which case, uh, in the beginning, God bara, he created out of nothing, if you like, the heavens and the earth. Um, I think Davidson would be pretty comfortable with that. I certainly am comfortable with that as, a, as an interpretation. Again, if I'm looking at science, I'm looking at uh, where does that theory change what we expect to see when we look at nature. There's a lot of new information about black holes that contradicts science's old black hole theories. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on science. You know, in a way, what Davidson is doing is perfectly legitimate. He's just looking at the scriptures and you know, forget science. Uh, because science has already failed in a very important way. It failed in, to be able to recognize the hand of an intelligent designer. In my opinion, it is failing to recognize how fast things can happen routinely and it probably has failed to recognize how fast things could have happened during the flood. And if that's the case, and we're going to have some more fun with some of that stuff, uh, then it kind of argues that uh, maybe science isn't as good at determining these things as it's cracked up to be. At least if you define science as the current scientific consensus. If you in instead define science as a study of the reproducible, it may be able to help us some, and it's worth looking at. Uh, but, but for Davidson's, from Davidson's point of view, he's an Old Testament scholar, and the scientists can figure out for themselves how that fits. <laughs> anyway. Um, just a word in defense of science. Um, I, I think we should not conflate uh, evolutionary dogma with science and scientific thinking or practice. You may have noticed I made that Thank point. you. Yes. Um, I'm very pleased to see that um, these alternative interpretations have been so clearly enunciated and dissected apart in this presentation because I have noticed two kinds of people who promote the young universe theory. Those who somehow believe that they're being more faithful than they otherwise would be if they didn't adopt that. And those who somehow believe that they can use it as a thin edge of the wedge in order to undermine the entire theory of creation as I've been confronted by certain people who wish to push theistic evolution. That if you're going to believe, uh, if you're going to believe creation, then you've got to believe, believe the whole universe. The whole thing, yes. Yeah. And, and this kind of situation seems to me that both of those positions are a bit flawed because in the first case, we're somehow focusing <laughs> the merits of a way of thinking based on how we feel about ourselves rather than about what the truth of the matter is. And the second is we basically are using whatever idea is handy in order to bash somebody else over the head. 
rather than try to find out what the truth is once again. And both strategies, I believe, are flawed because the focus is on us as humans rather than on what is the truth. I can't, uh, can't add to that significantly. Well, uh, at this point, I think it's a good time to quit. And uh, those of you who are interested, we'll be continuing on in Davidson's uh, art, uh, chapter. Uh, and I think it'll be a lot of fun for you. So come on back next week, and we'll have some more fun.